All right, so in this example, we have an easy way and we have a hard way. Now, maybe you have an idea on how to graph this. Maybe you have absolutely no idea how to graph this. Well, in this video, what I wanna do is explore two different ways, the easy as well as the hard way that we can graph this exponential equation. And the reason why I want to explore these two methods is because one gives you a better intuitive sense of how to graph this equation and what it's going to look like. And the other one gives you something much quicker and faster to be able to graph it. So therefore maybe you could identify the characteristics that you need or solve it as part of a larger problem. But just like any math teacher, I always like to start with the slow, the easy, and sometimes we like to call it the hard way to be able to graph an exponential equation. But it's really, really important for you to understand what I'm doing why I'm doing it and how I am doing it. Before you just go ahead and look in the description of this video for the timestamp that's gonna tell you how to jump to the faster portion. But if that's what you're looking for in this video, then feel free by all means to go jump right ahead. The main thing I want you to understand, if you're trying to graph this, we can always create a table. Remember table values, is just gonna be any X or Y points that we're gonna go ahead and pick. Now, the reason why table of values usually gets difficult for a lot of students is we don't know what values to pick. A lot of times students will see their textbook or they'll watch their teacher go ahead and write down values on the board and they're like, hey, how did you get that value? Hey, where did those come from? So if you're sleeping in class or maybe just never understood this concept, it's really important that how to understand where we're getting these values from. They're, so they're not always just gonna be like negative five to positive five or negative three to positive three or negative two to negative two. But typically when picking a set of values, we do wanna pick roughly around like five. That's usually going to be a good set for us to understand what this graph is gonna look like. Now, again, it comes into this problem, like where do these numbers come from and what do they represent? Well, remember, these represent the X value of the equation. And if we wanna find the Y value, then we just go ahead and plug them in. Now, I would not recommend using exactly these values. What I would recommend doing is, cause think about this, when you plug in a negative two, you're gonna have a negative two minus one is a negative three. Two to the negative third power is gonna be a one over eight. Now you could add that to three, but I wanna to try to find the smallest values that are relatively not too difficult to be able to figure out. So in this case, what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna actually gonna start at negative one and I'm gonna go all the way through three. Now again, you could pick any numbers you want to. You could pick three numbers if you want to. I always like to pick five and I obviously want them to be close to each other so I can get a general idea of what this graph is gonna look like. Now again, to find the Y coordinate, all I simply need to do is plug these values in for X to go ahead and solve for Y. Now in this first example, you can see we're kind of starting out with the most difficult one, but again, everything's gonna get a little bit easier after that. And again, that kind of comes down to this, that hard portion of plugging values into a table to be able to find the coordinate points. So a negative one minus a one is going to be a negative two. Two raised, so this is gonna be a two raised to the negative second power plus three. Right? Well, two raised to the negative second power is gonna be the same thing as a one over two squared. So that's going to be a four plus three. Now, if I wanted to go ahead and combine these, what I can do is put this over one and then multiply by a four over four. What that's gonna do is that's gonna give me a common denominator here of four. And three times four is going to be 12. So that's gonna to equal to a 13 fourths. Now, you might still be concerned and like, how do I actually graph a 13 fourths? Well, again, just think about this as like as a mixed number. How many times does four go into 13? You could say, well, it goes into 12 three times, right? And you could say, yeah, it's gonna go into 12 three times with one extra unit. So we can say that's gonna be a three and one fourth or a 3.25 if you wanna use that as a decimal equivalent. Now in this example here, zero minus one is just a negative one. So you're gonna put the negative one in the denominator, right? So that's gonna be a two to the negative one plus three, which again, I can rewrite that as a one half plus three, and again, do the exact same thing here. Now in this case, I'm gonna multiply by two over two, right? Cause I wanna get the common denominator here. So I'll do the exact same thing. And in this case, I'll have three times two, which is six plus one is seven. So that'd be seven halves. And again, I can again do again the decimal approximation here. Two is gonna go into seven. It's going to be three times and there's gonna be one extra. So that's going to be a three and one half. Now, right now you might say, well, it looks like it's getting a little bit bigger, right? You know, three and one quarter, that's 0.25. Three and one half is gonna be 3.5, just a little bit, but not too much bigger. Now let's go and get into when I plug in one. So one minus one is zero. So therefore this is a two to the zero plus three. Well, two to the zero, right, is just one. So one plus three here is gonna equal a four. So that's gonna be four, which is obviously much bigger than 3.5. Then let's get into the two. So this way, as I two have minus one, which is going to be a one. So this is two to the first power plus three. Well, two to the first power is just two. So two plus three is gonna equal a five. And then when I get to three here, um, three minus one is going to be two. So therefore this is a two squared plus three and two squared is gonna be four. Four plus three is gonna equal a seven. 
So now you can see this graph is growing rather quickly. Now, it's always kind of difficult to graph something like this when you're dealing with decimals or with fractions. But again, if we're just kind of looking into getting a general idea of what this graph is going to be looking like, we can kind of make an assumption here as far as where this graph is going to be approaching. Now, the tough thing, the hard part about doing a table like this is we don't really know exactly where the graph looks like if we don't know where the asymptotes are going to be. So that's why it's gonna be helpful to kind of have a general understanding of this graph. But again, we'll get to that in the next portion, which is going to be the quicker version. So based on this table, I can go ahead and graph a X, Y axis just like this. Okay, so now if I wanted to plot these points here, I'd have a negative one, right? And we could go up to 3.25 or three and a quarter. So one, two, three, and then two, five would be something like that. Then if I'm at zero, I want to go three and a half, right? So one, two, three, and then up three and a half. It's gonna be right there. And then I can go to one, four. That'd be up from right there. I can go to two, five, which is right there. And then I can go to three over seven. So over three from the origin, right? Origin zero, zero over three, up seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so the cool thing about this graph is we can really start to see what's going on. This graph is gonna start increasing very, very quickly. So how do we go about going over to the left? Well, if we have a general idea of what exponential functions look like, we, you might already know the answer to that. But if you don't, well, we're gonna have to start going a little bit farther over. Let's go and check out the value negative two and negative three. Now again, I didn't do this from the beginning. I said, eh, that's gonna be kind of messy math. Let's kind of not do that. And again, to draw a general, to get some coordinate points, that would be absolutely correct. But if we need to like explore and we need to investigate what is actually happening to this graph, is it going to go down just like this one is going up? We do need to be able to figure out what is gonna happen with this table when x equals negative two and when x equals negative three and beyond. So let's go ahead and explore that for these two problems so we can get a general idea of what exactly is happening to this exponential equation moving to the left. Okay, so to do that, I'm gonna do exactly what we just did in the previous example. I'm gonna go and plug in a negative two and a negative three in for x, and then we're gonna go ahead and simplify. Now, remember that last one we got, kinda got a little messy, right, to 13, four, so and this one's only gonna get worse, but it's not bad. We can actually overcome this, it's okay. So let's just kinda do this step by step to make sure we're all on the same page. So we have negative two minus one is going to be a negative three, right? So that's a two to the negative third power plus three. Now again, we can rewrite that as a one over a two thirds and two raised to the third power is going to equal an eight. So therefore I can rewrite this as a one over eight plus three. Now again, just like I did in the previous examples, I'm gonna put this over one and I'm gonna get my common denominator, which is going to be over eight. So I'm gonna multiply by an eight on the top and the bottom. Eight times three is a 24 plus one is a 25. So this is gonna be a 25 over eight. Now again, remember going back to just writing this as a mixed number. 8 goes into 24 three times, right, with one extra unit in there. So that'd be 1 eighth if you're going to write this as a mixed number. So that'd be a 3 and 1 eighth, which is going to be a little bit smaller here, right there, right? Now let's go and do the negative 3. So negative 3 minus 1 is going to be a negative 4. So therefore, that's going to be a 2 to the negative 4th plus 3. Now again, if I had 2 to the negative 4th, I can go ahead and write, rewrite that as 1 over 2 to the 4th which is gonna be a one over 16 plus three. Now again, doing the exact same thing, put this over one, and again, I'm gonna multiply by 16 over 16, so therefore I can combine these. A three times 16 is going to be a 48, plus one, which is going to be a 49 over a 16. Now again, how many times does 16 go into 49? It goes in there three times now, but with one 16th. Well, one 16th is half as big as one eighth, right? So therefore that's gonna be even smaller, getting closer. And so what I want you to understand here is as we keep on going farther and farther to the left, it kind of looks like those that extra fraction is getting cut in half, cut in half. And if everything keeps on getting cut in half, though, we're never actually going to get to three, right? It's approaching three, but we're just keep on cutting, getting smaller and smaller and smaller fractions, but it's never, ever going to get to actually zero. So what's actually going on to the left is it's approaching the number three. So hopefully you can see here on this left hand side, what we have is what we call an asymptote. That's going to be the value where the graph is going to be approaching, okay? So this is a very intuitive way for you to be able to understand using the graphing method. But now what I want to do is show you a quicker, faster, easier way to not only understand exponential equations, but also be able to graph them. Okay, so now we have the general idea that we understand if we ever get stuck or confused on graphing an exponential equation, we can always revert back to the table formula. And I want you to remember that because it's very helpful to be able to check your understanding or check data points on a graph using a table. But if we wanna graph something, we want a quick way to be able to understand what the graph looks like, it's important to know two things. One, the parent graph, 
and to the transformations. This is an exponential equation. The parent graph of an exponential equation looks just like this. Okay, it doesn't matter what the base is, but as long as there's no transformations, we have a y-intercept at 0, 1, and we have a horizontal asymptote at 0. Okay, so you can see the domain is all real numbers, but the range is restricted from zero to infinity. So now what we need to do is understand our transformations. Now again, for any function, the transformations are gonna affect the graph exactly the same. But the main thing we need to understand is are we applying transformations are inside the function or outside the function? So we need to understand what exactly the function is for a, this exponential equation. And this exponential equation looks like y equals a base raised to the power x, where the input is as the exponent. So if you recognize your transformations here, when I am subtracting inside of the function, right? Because this is inside the exponent. When I do minus one, that's actually going to be shifting the graph one unit to the right. When I add outside of the function, right? Because this is not a part of this exponent, this is outside the function, that's going to be a vertical shift three units up. You can make this exact same understanding with just looking at quadratics. If you remember y equals x squared, we did this exact same thing, right? Here's y equals x squared. That graph looks something like this. Now, if I subtract inside the equation and add three, that's going to affect the graph, right? Look at this y equals a x minus one quantity squared plus three. Notice how the one is inside, right? And the three is outside. Now, what is this gonna do to the quadratic? This is gonna shift the graph one unit to the right and three units up. Now, what is it exactly I moved? I moved the whole graph, right? But specifically, I moved the vertex, right? I moved the lowest point on the graph. I shifted it over one unit and then up three. So what are we gonna to want to move in this equation? Well, the one point that we have for our parent graph is the y-intercept. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going to shift this graph one inch to the right and then three units up. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what the graph looks like. It now has a y-intercept of one comma four, and then it has a horizontal asymptote here at three. Now, again, the asymptote is not a part of the graph, but it is where the graph is approaching. So that's why we do like to write that in with that dashed line. It's also important to recognize that the domain has not been changed. It's still all real numbers. And then the range is going to be from three to infinity. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully this video was helpful. If you want more examples of graphing exponential equations, go ahead and check out the playlist and resources I have below or check out the next video I have for you here. Cheers.